This microwave beam of energy is capable of melting rock in under a second, and it may finally unlock a near infinite supply of energy for use that has otherwise remained forever out of reach. A recent study from the Department of Energy calculated that by using a mere 0.1% of geothermal heat energy under our feet, humanity's electricity needs could be met for the next 2 million years, by which time fusion would only be 5 years away. The trouble though with geothermal is that no one can dig deep enough to actually reach it. This unlimited source of energy sits on average 10 kilometers or more below the Earth's surface, and that's a problem. Some of the deepest holes we We've ever drilled were the German Continental Deep Drilling Program, which reached 9.1 kilometers, and the Kola Super Deep Borehole in Russia, which reached 12 kilometers but took 24 years to drill and cost an estimated $10 billion. At these extreme depths, the temperature and the properties of the rock dull drill bits in a couple of hours, and pulling that drill bit all the way back up to the surface to replace it and then send it back down the hole takes days at a time for each leg of the journey. Drilling becomes essentially impossible. But we may finally have a solution. From an invention originally developed for the fusion industry, capable of vaporizing rock into a gas which can be blown out of the borehole, giving us access to geothermal in every city in the world. I'm really interested in this space, the promise of infinite energy sitting just below your feet yet always out of reach, I always thought was a really compelling idea, and understanding why it is so hard to make happen and how we might one day actually achieve it ticks all the right science, technology, and solving a problem worth solving parts of my brain. So that's the journey that I want to go on, and I want to bring you with me. I reached out to Quay's Energy, the team behind this technology, to better understand the problem that they face. Rock is so hot, so abrasive, so hard, that your drill bit will waste away, it will wear in a matter of hours. To put this into perspective, you know, it's going to take you 10 days to replace a drill bit in the time that you pull it out of the hole and put it back into the hole again. So meanwhile, you're paying $100,000 to the drill rig, to the drill crew. So it just gets astronomically expensive. We're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars to get these wells done. Um, so that's the challenge we're going to address. No drill bits, nowhere, no time wasted. Geothermal hotspots like Iceland lie over the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, a volcanic zone that superheats subterranean water to temperatures far over 100 degrees Celsius. These temperatures aren't typically possible at the Earth's surface because here at normal atmospheric pressures, water begins to boil at 100 degrees C, so that's the maximum temperature it can reach. But at depths as little as a few kilometers below our feet, the weight of the Earth pushing down on it and the volcanic temperatures surrounding surrounding it can mean that water can stay liquid even at temperatures above 300 degrees Celsius. To make use of that incredible energy contained in superheated water, you turn to what humans always end up employing, using it to run a steam engine. When superheated water is brought up to the surface, the drop in pressure on it causes it to naturally evaporate into steam. When this happens, a given volume of liquid water expands by 1600 times when it converts into steam. This high pressure steam can now be fed into a turbine to generate electricity or piped directly to nearby towns to supply them with hot water. This allows Icelandic stations like Hetlisteli to reliably produce approximately 300 megawatts of electricity and 400 megawatts of thermal energy just by essentially turning on the tap. And it even enables bananas, a usually tropical crop, to be grown in greenhouses in the heart of the Icelandic environment. Importantly, Iceland can achieve all of this because hot geothermal energy sits on average just a couple of kilometers below the surface there. Around the rest of the world, this energy source is more like 10 to 20 kilometers down, and that means traditional drilling approaches just don't work. How do you do the drilling technology that can do deep and hot? And when you try to apply existing technologies to that challenge, what you'll find is that it's just not economically viable, if at all possible. Drill bits wear too quickly, you spend too much time changing drill bits and not drilling, or you just can't get the energy down there to drill the rock. But you really need to change physics. We have to move away from mechanical drill bits. We have to move away from grinding rock into burning, vaporizing, and conveying a lot of energy through wave guides. Different physics, different results, it opens a new realm. 
The case for geothermal is obviously compelling if only we could reach it. So how is an old fusion technology helping to change the game? I'll cover that in a moment. Before I get there, we have to talk about something that I think about a lot, which is inventing a technology is one thing. Making sure there is actually a political and a market will to drive its adoption is another. And that's why I'm excited to be working with today's sponsor, Ground News, an app and website that gathers related news stories on any topic from around the world and across the political spectrum. At the moment, there's a lot of press about clean technologies, particularly looking at the bipartisan threat these technologies face. Ground News finds eight articles on recent geothermal announcements with varying levels of factuality and political leaning. Whether you're an inventor, investor, or just curious about understanding a topic from outside of your usual social media echo chamber, Ground News is great for identifying any biases, motives, and contradictions in reporting and public opinion. Another feature that caught my attention was the blind spot feed that shows you news that only has been covered by one side of the political spectrum and ignored by the other, allowing you to see which issues are the focus of either party. If you care about accurate reporting and understanding the full spectrum of opinions, check out Ground News at ground.news forward slash Dr. Ben to subscribe for 40% off the Vantage subscription, which is the one that I use. Thank you to Ground News for supporting the channel. Now let's take a look under the hood of how Quasar's energy actually works and what it might unlock for geothermal energy. The technology that Quasar are using comes from the field of fusion. Fusion reactors require very high temperature ionized gases to operate, typically trying to create plasmas higher than 100 million degrees Celsius. Achieving these temperatures and also stopping them from melting the containers that contain them is one of the main challenges of realizing successful fusion. MIT fusion scientist Paul Wozkow was the inventor of the technology underpinning Quasar's approach to drilling. Wozkow focused his attention on something called a gyrotron, a technology commonly used to heat plasmas through high-powered radiation. Paul Wozkow, back in 2007, said, hey, I I have an idea. How about we use gyrotrons and instead of heating hydrogen to initiate a plasma, we heat a rock to vaporize it. He established that this is physically possible. He established a uh, sound scientific basis for doing the process. And in the lab, he basically convinced me first and my investors next that there is merit in pursuing this idea. So the, the big breakthrough is a drilling technology, borrowing ideas from fusion, repurposed for drilling into the ground for geothermal. To produce this radiation, gyrotrons use a high temperature wire to emit electrons through a process called thermionic emission, also sometimes called the Edison effect. These electrons are accelerated by an electric field before being subjected to a strong varying magnetic field that causes the electrons to spiral or gyrate on their path. The sudden slowing down or deflection of charged particles in a magnetic field can spontaneously emit photons called bremsstrahlung radiation. The frequency of this radiation depends on the frequency of the oscillation of that applied magnetic field. In the gyrotron quasar developing, this radiation is in the millimeter or microwave wave band, the same frequency spectrum inside your microwave that heats your food. The idea here is to produce this microwave radiation at the surface and couple it into a waveguide and direct that power into the bottom of the borehole. Here it superheats the rock, vaporizing it and leaving a glass-like surface on the walls of the borehole. We usually think of waveguides as things like optical fibers that we send visible light down, which is how most computers communicate with the internet. Because microwaves have much longer wavelengths than visible light, the waveguides that we designed for them need to be wider and patterned to keep the beam in inside the guide all the way down. At the moment, Carlos and his team are building lab-based systems to test their designs, which we can see some early operational tests of here. The output from the Quase system is a one megawatt microwave beam that is sent down a tube about 20 centimeters across. In just seconds, the rock that it strikes begins to vaporize. And I wanna pause just for a second, because here you might be hearing microwaves again and again, and assuming that the system is heating water inside the rock the way that your home microwave interacts with the dipole moment of water molecules to heat up your food. That's not quite what's actually happening here. What Quase is producing is actually much more like a laser. It heats by depositing photon energy onto the surface of the rock, the same way a laser system or a solar cooker achieves 
achieves heating. And actually what this means is that the deeper that they drill and the hotter the natural rock environment becomes, the better this system starts to operate because essentially the rock has been pre-warmed and ready for vaporization for them. So what does this actually mean though in terms of how fast they can drill? If we follow this handy table I found online for the energy required to vaporize rock, a one megawatt beam gives us an estimated rate of about 37 cubic centimeters per second, or digging at a depth rate of about 0.1 centimeters per second. Now this sounds slow and it kind of is compared to traditional oil and gas drilling, which is more like 100 meters per hour, but the drill bit never wears down and never needs the multi-day turnaround to bring it up to the surface and send down a shot. One. We talk in terms of a meter to five meters per hour, average, not instantaneously. Drillers will boast they can do much faster than that, but they have to stop to replace drill bits. So on average, they do a lot less than that. It's like the tortoise and the hare. The hare can go very quickly, but it goes to sleep. It doesn't run, so the tortoise goes ahead. That means that rather than 24 years to drill something like the Kola Super Deep Borehole, it implies you could dig a 10 kilometer hole in around 100 days. If that is true, that is game changing. So how are Quay is actually planning to get there? At the latter half of this year, they are aiming to have a ready to roll out field testable device. We're going to do that this year. We're building two machines. One is low power, 100 kilowatts, and the second one is high power, a megawatt. And we're going to take those into the field starting in the second half of this year to drill 100 to 1,000 meters deep first, and then 300 to 500 degrees Celsius, very likely in a high geothermal gradient zone, which means three to five kilometers. I think the technical progress alone here is really compelling, but ultimately developing these projects will be expensive and will require support from governments and other partners. So far, Quays have raised $95 million from grants and investors, but realizing the full system could require significant amounts of further capital. In order to reduce the cost to actually deliver these sorts of systems, Quays plans to piggyback off of existing infrastructure. By drilling geothermal wells to produce new steam sources, this heat source could be used to fire up old turbines formerly powered by coal or gas, saving hugely on capital expenditure required to deliver this system and making use of the pre-built energy grid that sweeps out from these sites. The success of these projects will inevitably depend on their ability to produce energy at competitive costs. Quays is aiming for a price point comparable or lower than today's renewables, with the benefit that these systems run 24 hours a day providing a baseload other than just when the sun shines or the wind blows. So they are pitching this as a complementary piece of the energy environment or ecosystem. Actually more competitive than wind and solar when you firm it up. So I think this is really what it's trying to do is to position a firm, reliable, 24-7 source of clean power that is geographically agnostic in this range, 10 cents per kilowatt hour or below range. There are obviously some competing geothermal approaches worth mentioning here, such as drilling shallower boreholes. These will operate at much cooler temperatures, but contact with the rock could be increased by shattering it with high pressure fluids. This sounds a lot like fracking because it is a lot like fracking. Fracking for geothermal is less likely to release oil into reservoirs, which is one of the main concerns, but injecting high pressure fluids underground already has led to ground slips, including South Korea's second largest ever recorded earthquake, which injured 90 people and caused tens of millions of dollars of damages. On the other end of the scale though, there could also be competition from extremely hot and shallow boreholes that drill directly into magma pools. The Krafla Magma testbed in Iceland is developing a research facility to understand volcanic activity and how to extract energy from the most extreme possible approach to geothermal, molten rock at 900 degrees Celsius. Though obviously the downside of these approaches is that they all currently require hot sources at limited distances below Earth's surface. Quays aims to be the first technology capable of operating super deep and super hot. If it can reliably achieve 10 to 20 kilometer boreholes, that would allow geothermal almost anywhere in the world. Question of why do something so complicated and so science fiction? You know, why get out of your way 
and do something this hard? And the answer is because there's nothing else that can actually do it. There's a big part of the world in my conversation that subscribes to the notion that wind, solar, and batteries will get us there, and it won't. That's very far from being true. So we have a gap, and we need to close the gap with things like this. Not because it's a cool business opportunity, but because there's no other way to decarbonize fully. This is a few less, waste less energy source. You build it, you're energy secure at point of generation. And it's truly geographically agnostic. The only difference between a good place and a bad place is a delta of 10 kilometers depth range. That's it. That's like a trip to the supermarket. We're talking about the difference between the most geothermally viable place on earth to the least one, having a difference of only 10 kilometers. I don't think anything comes close to that. This is why we do this. It transforms the energy landscape and geopolitics, and it provides for the abundance of energy that we need in a clean form. I always think taking many approaches to solve big problems is the right way forward, and I will always celebrate bold teams that are tackling the hardest of the hard problems. If you like this video, you might like the team that I met a couple of weeks ago that are planning to build a solar farm in space, and have already built a way to wirelessly beam its energy back down to Earth. As always, thank you very much for watching what it is that I do. Really appreciate your support. I will see you next week. Goodbye.